Um, all right, so today's topic uh, from Hildebrand on marriage and procreation has come up several times already through, uh, throughout the week, especially last night. Um, but I think uh, not everything came out, and what came out bears uh, repeating. So I'm going to just go, go ahead with it, and um, hopefully it'll be worth your while. So the topic, as I see it, is especially on this, the meaning, the essential connection between the, uh, the idea that love is the, is the meaning, the essence of marriage, the mutual self donation of the spouses, and that idea that procreation is the primary end. Um, so I will try to focus on the link between marriage and procreation. Now, uh, there can be no doubt, I think, anyone who knows from Hildebrand that he intends to maintain the teaching, right? And he's often compared with other people like Herbert Domes, who, uh, who denies it in so many words. Um, Von Hildebrand certainly fully intends to maintain that the primary end of marriage is procreation. And even though he doesn't emphasize it much. And uh, I think in that regard, what Kevin said yesterday, the idea that you can learn a lot from an author by looking at the, um, at the uh, assumptions that he makes. And um, in Van Hildebrandt, there is very clearly this assumption that procreation is essential to marriage. And uh, so much so that it, it hardly bears, uh, it hardly needs to be mentioned. So the fact that he doesn't stress it enough, I think, should not lead us to think that he thinks it unimportant. But there are other people who are very sympathetic, otherwise, to Hildebrand's views, who doubt whether he succeeds, uh, theoretically, to keep the two things together, love and procreation. For instance, we saw in Lonergan, the piece in Lonergan that we read, that um, his language <clears throat> is inexcusably vague. What does meaning mean? Lonergan said there, were, there was a book with 600 definitions, and then Mark Roberts, uh, apparently having read the book, said there were only 104 or 204 meanings. I wish I could say they were both wrong, and there were 314 meanings, <laughs> but I haven't seen the book, and it's really besides the point. Um, there surely is some room for clarifying the meaning of meaning. I'm not going to do that. I'm not qualified to do that uh, very precisely, so don't look to me for that one. And the other, another frequently heard objection is that von Hildebrand unwittingly turns procreation into a merely accidental or a very external uh, connection. He, 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 he conceives of the connection as an accidental and external one, something that is not constitutive, in other words, of the essence of marriage. And I will try to address that one uh, today. Now, because it seems to me that von Hildebrand's thought is better and clearer than such critics allow. So I will focus on a particular aspect in this book, his defense of humane vitae. I won't cover everything. We can discuss things in the questions if you think I haven't mentioned them and would like to bring them up. But I have a particular aspect I want to bring out. And what I want to bring out is that von Hildebrand's view of the connection between love and procreation in marriage is not just there, that he doesn't just deny procreation as the primary end, that his view is not just compatible with that traditional teaching, but rather that his view is better and deeper, that his view has advantages. Uh, specifically, perhaps I can put it this way, that his view does full justice to the personal structure and context of the act, well, of the institution and the act. I will, uh, I mean both marriage and sexuality in this uh, talk, even though I won't always distinguish between them. So let me briefly restate a few things that we've already covered before on the idea that love is the primary meaning. 
that, that it is in some ways this mutual self-donation is the essence or meaning of marriage and also that sexuality is the embodiment, the bodily expression and enactment of that meaning. So, Van Hildebrand, as we've seen, says that sex is not just a biological instinct. It's much uh, more than that. Nor is it a kind of low, animal-like, regrettable duty that spouses are bound to take up in order to serve uh, the, the, uh, the procreation uh, of, of the human species. So he rejects both a hedonistic and a puritanical view of sexuality. Both of these are fundamentally mistaken because they miss the intrinsic meaning of marriage and sexuality as being uh, spousal love. Hedonism reduces uh, particularly sexuality to a mere a means to pleasure. Puritanism, to be very brief, makes it a mere means, legitimate only in marriage, but rather dubious even there, uh, to children. Right? So, um, and one point, one point which maybe hasn't come out fully is that sexuality, of course, is in some ways a much broader reality, that, the reality than just the, the marital act itself. And uh, the difference between, between a beautiful kiss, for instance, which is not necessarily illegitimate outside of marriage, uh, caressing and so on, um, but Van Hildebrand realizes that only in that sexual act, that, uh, that only there, there's an expression of the full self-donation. That, that sexual act, as he puts it on page 20 in this book, is the full and irrevocable, uh, rather the expression of the full and irrevocable mutual consent to become one. Um, all right, so those things we've already seen. I just wanted to highlight them at the beginning. Now, as to the question of how procreation fits into all of this, there's much to be said, but the key distinction that von Hildebrand makes is between instrumental and um, superabundant finality. So let's uh, look at that concept. On page 31 of my version, uh, this one of, uh, of the essay, when Hildebrandt writes that, the in, that in instrumental finality, the end is the exclusive raison d'etre of the means. In superabundant finality, the good serving the end has, has also a raison d'etre in itself. So, instrumental finality uh, explains the entire meaning and purpose of the means, whereas in superabundant finality, uh, the thing that leads to the end has a full meaning in and of itself. It's raison d'etre. Its reason for being is not just to serve the means. Uh, all right, so a typical case of instru instrumental finality, one that he mentions in the book, is something like a knife. The end or purpose of the knife is cutting, and that cutting that determines the entire nature and all the individual uh, characteristics of the knife. The knife is a mere means, utterly worthless if it no longer works properly. Right? You toss out the knife, buy a new one. Um, and the superabundant finality, the finality which leaves intact the, 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 uh, the meaning of the, uh, of the thing that leads to the end, is illustrated by the example of knowledge. Knowledge, as we all know, is very important for all sorts of practical reasons. It's very important to know where we are meeting if you want to listen to this lecture, right? But that practical benefit that knowledge bestows is not the essence of knowledge. Knowledge is not fully explained. Its value doesn't lie in that practical use. Knowledge has... A, a, a meaning and value in and of itself. All right, clearly knowledge then has a value, a meaning prior to the ends that it serves, especially the practical use that uh, we can put to it. So I'll come back to this analogy later um, because I think it, it could be misunderstood. Um, 
but I'll save that for later. Um, so the point is that procreation is related to marriage and to the sexual act in the manner of superabundant finality. Uh, children are the natural, the meaningful, the superabundant fruit of the love between the spouses. And again, as I said in the beginning, this way of conceiving of the link deepens and enriches it and strengthens it rather than weakening and making it external, say. So, before I uh, say a little bit more about that, I want to make one more point, uh, one more, take one more objection that von Hildebrand, I think, answers very well. Sometimes people might think that, the, uh, that it's true from the point of human experience that when we get married, we do it because we love the other person. And when we engage in sexuality, then it is an expression of love and intimacy between the two persons. But the objection goes from the point of view of God in the, in the large scheme of things. What matters is not uh, that, roman that romance between the couple, the pleasure that they derive from sexuality and so on, in the larger scheme, from God's point of view, in other words, the real meaning is procreation. And uh, you could say that it's very nice and very wise of God to connect that, uh, that sexual act with pleasure and with all sorts of romantic feelings because that makes us willing participants in this reproductive scheme. All right, so the idea is that all of that's very nice, it makes us willing, but the basic idea in God's eye, objectively speaking, is still that it is just a means to propagate the human race. And von Hildebrand argues against this view that this doesn't really recognize how seriously God takes us as persons, that we are not mere puppets in God's uh, plan. That God, whereas there are many things, say, in the animals, that, that there's a kind of intelligence, a kind of purpose to um, things that animals do, uh, but they themselves are not aware of this purpose at all. They're sort of, uh, the purpose is worked out apart from their consciousness, apart from their freedom. They simply do what they've been given to do for a purpose they hardly uh, know. In human beings, in persons, uh, it's not like that. God does not work out his purposes over the head of the human person. No, the human person uh, knows these purposes, knows the meanings of his acts, and it is fully intended also by God that he uh, works at them consciously, that he, that he relates to them consciously and not just um, in order to achieve the end. So the full, say the spirituality, the meaning, the participation, the intelligence, the freedom of the person is intended by God to be a part of uh, that, uh, the, the, his larger plans, including that of procreation and, and uh, creating more souls uh, for his kingdom. Yes, good so far? All right, then I'm skipping one point, hopefully to come back to it if I have time. And then, I want to now briefly point out why I think this view of viewing the relation, or this, this view of the relation between marriage and procreation, sex and procreation, is uh, deeper, more satisfying than, uh, than what came before, at least in the minds of many. Um, the key insight, there are several, I have several points here. One is this, that it overcomes the danger of viewing marriage and sexuality as a merely utilitarian institution, as simply a means to an end, right? So it safeguards the centrality of love. That, I think, is very important, and it already has come out several times uh, during the week. A second point is related to this, but it explains why the spouses 
are normally and but also rightly focused on each other, uh, both in, in getting married but also in and during the sexual act. They can even engage in that act knowing full well that they are not fertile at the moment. Um, so this focus on one another is entirely proper. Why? Because procreation is not the direct aim, but it is the fruit that comes from the love, which is their central focus. Now, you've read um, von Hildebrand on this, and so I thought maybe as a, a, a separate witness to the same truth, I'd quote uh, Wojtyla from Love and Responsibility. He's making a very similar point here that's also stressed by von Hildebrand in, in several of his works. So here's the passage from Wojtyla. If you have the book, it's on page 234. He says, marital intercourse is in itself an interpersonal act, an act of betrothed love, so that the intentions and the attention of each partner must be fixed upon the other, upon his or her true good. They, the spouses, must not be concentrated on the possible consequences of the act, especially if that would mean a diversion of attention from the partner it is certainly not necessary always to resolve that we are performing this act in order to become parents. It is sufficient to say that in performing this act we know that we may become parents and we are willing for that to happen. That approach alone is compatible with love and makes it possible to share the experience of love. A man and woman become father and mother only in consequence of the, more, of the marital act, it must be an act of love, an act of unification of persons, and not merely the instrument or means of procreation. Right? So that's, I think, uh, very much the same point uh, from a different, well-respected author. Now, the Yes, go ahead. Comment here that that's a sort of a direct hit on Augustine's teaching. Yes. Good. <laughs> I want to jump to the defense of Augustine, but but let's. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Now, the third point has not yet come up, uh, perhaps as much as it should have, but I think it's important to bring up, and that is that. This way of conceiving of the connection also guards the status of the children and that result. The children, it's very important, especially in today's culture, to, to see that children are the fruit of the love between the parents rather than the product of their activity. Children are, are you could say, begotten, not made if it's not irreverent to use those terms. See, in the, in the creed, what's the meaning of that? Well, probably a lot of meaning I don't get, but central to it is the idea that um, the son is begotten, not made. That means he is equal to the father, of the same nature as the father, not a product subordinate to the father. He is not related to the father as a creature is related to the creator. Right? So a very similar truth is at stake in the relation between parents and children. They are begotten, not made, meaning that the children are not subordinate uh, to the parents. They are persons just like the parents, standing next to them and uh, of equal value to the parents. Of course, I know their children and so on. I'm not denying all that. But, but the most basic truth is that parents have given um, I have participated in the, pro in the uh, creation of a new human person who is equally valuable and of the same nature as they are themselves. So that idea that the child is not the product, subordinate somehow to the parents or to the lab technician or whatever else is going on, uh, but rather the fruit of love, uh, begotten, not made, I think is very central and it is captured beautifully in this idea of superabundant finality, and it gets lost, I think, uh, in instrumental finality. 
Another way of saying that same thing, perhaps, is this, that, or it's bringing out another aspect of it. Unlike marriage, or the marital act, which is in the control of the spouses, it is something that the, um, that, that, that the spouses initiate and do. Children are always a gift that they receive. Right? So think even just of how of the facts of the matter. Uh, conception happens only sometimes, not always. Right? And, that, and that's already one very clear way in which the parents don't exactly do it uh, like they perform the sexual act itself. Also, conception takes place after the sexual act, uh, not, not during and sometimes, I don't know, <laughs> I should know, but I don't know exactly how long it could take, uh, hours, maybe days, right? Uh, and not only that, but parents are not conscious of it when it happens. Conception can take place while mom is doing the dishes and father is at work in the office. Both of them don't know this is happening. This momentous event, the coming into being of a new person, where God directly touches the woman. None of this is conscious, uh, and it happens separate from, or apart from in time, the, uh, the, the, the sexual act. And then, of course, lastly, it's God. I mean, this takes the, the uh, eyes of faith, but nevertheless, we know it's God that infuses the soul. So. There is also there this indirect connection only. We don't make the child. We are uh, participants in the making of it. But the final and most important um, act, uh, we leave to God. And he does it, and then we receive it gratefully, or he does not do it. And then we have still expressed and enacted our love between one another. And again, this truth, I think, is very important to stress, especially today, when so many are beginning to think of children as products. Even Catholics are now speaking of making babies, right? It's a very common way of talking, but really, it's a, it's, we should resist it, I think, because we're not making babies at all. It's a very inadequate and almost demeaning expression, uh, especially with regard to the child. Donum Vitae has stressed this, uh, the, the importance of this, and the importance of the child. It, it says that the child has the right to be the fruit of the specific act of the conjugal love of his parents. That, that the child originates in love and knows that it originated in love. That, I think, is a, uh, as the, the, that document says, a right of the child. It's also, as many studies have shown, psychologically and so on, extremely important for the child. There's a kind of wound there, a deep wound, if that knowledge is lacking, or, or worse, if the reality is lacking. So those are the th three or so ways out that were most helpful in bringing out uh, that, again, von Hildebrand doesn't just keep the two together, procreation and love, but he deepens in significant ways the link between them and shows how this way of conceiving it is the only way that's, that's adequate to the persons involved, the only way that lives up, as Wojtyla might say, to the demands of the personalistic norm. Right? So I have a, an objection that I'd like to get to, but perhaps if there are any questions or comments, I should um, let you get to them. Any... any uh, Observations? No, just go on with the objection. All right, well. It's, uh, it's this one. The objection has been made uh, to the analogy with knowledge that I mentioned earlier. Remember the distinction between instrumental and um, superabundant finality was explained using knowledge. Uh, knowledge has practical uses. Uh, that's a, an obvious purpose of knowledge, but knowledge itself is not defined in terms of these practical uses. The meaning of knowledge does not depend on the practical use of knowledge. So that, that analogy may lend itself to the idea that von Hildebrand's view of the connection is external. 
uh, merely accidental. Because even knowledge that's not practical um, is still fully um, knowledge. Whereas, so, so the practical use of knowledge doesn't enter into the definition of knowledge, you could say. And that is very different, of course, with regard to marriage and procreation, the sexual act and the procreative dimension of it. Procreation is of the essence of sexuality. The procreative end is of the essence of marriage um, in, a, in a much closer way than the analogy with knowledge would suggest. Fruitfulness, in other words, is not just a consequence, it determines the kind of act that it is. Intercourse is essentially a procreative act. So, you see what I mean? It's very important to, to show that, that this superabundant finality does not imply externality or mere accidentality, if that's a word. Um, so, t um, to guard against this, this uh, interpretation, which is, which is really not, not satisfying, it might have been good if Van Hildebrand had distinguished between different ways in which, um, or between different kinds of superabundance. In uh, my place in New Hampshire, where I'll be going tomorrow, there's a beautiful apple tree that stands in front of the house. And um, that apple tree provides all sorts of abundant goods uh, that are not really... Um, for instance, it provides shade. Very nice on a day like today. It also provides... It's like a jungle gym for the children. They climb in there, 10 at the same time. They sit there. They often have lunch there. Um, uh, and so on. So there's, it, it, it's, it's very beautiful. So there are all these goods that are connected to the apple tree. Uh, and for all I know, God really want. Well, I think I do know <laughs> God wanted those goods um, to be connected to the apple tree. Birds that, that, that um, build their nests in it and so on. All sorts of goods. But clearly... The apple is a fruit in a much stronger sense of the apple tree. The, the apple is also a good connected with the apple tree, a superabundant good, a, a, a fruit that flows from the nature of the tree but is not to be identified with the tree. Um, so what I would want to, to see is to have that distinction developed, that the, that, the, that the relationship between the apple, its sort of natural fruit, and all these other goods, providing shade, beauty, jungle, gym time, and so on, that that connection is very different. Uh, and the, the, the fruit, the apple, goes into the essence of what an apple tree is. That's why it's an apple tree and not a pear tree or a cherry tree, right? So apples, the fruit, goes into the essence of the tree. It specifies the kind of tree uh, that it is. So similar with sexuality, it has all sorts of goods um, apart from procreation, uh, from the from the most beautiful to the to the to the more uh, modest. I mean, it relieves tension. Uh, for instance, that's not uh, the essence. It's not the most beautiful thing to say about it. Maybe it even has health benefits of all sorts. You know, there are studies coming out all the time talking about the health benefits of sexuality. Some people talk about sex exercise and so on. Um, all these goods are really connected with sexuality and for all I know God may have intended them to be connected with sexuality but clearly the fruit there that kind of good that superabundantly flows from it is not connected intrinsically to sexuality as such it doesn't define the essence of sexuality procreation that is to say children are the natural fruit children the, uh, are the fruit in the same sense or, in, well, analogy, as an analogy, similarly uh, as the apple being the fruit of the tree. So the, the, the capacity, the, the, the ordination for that act to lead to children is part of the essence of the act, just like the f capacity of the tree to bear apples turns it into an apple tree, so the capacity of the sexual act to... Uh, to be procreative turns it into a procreative act. So that's all I wanted to say here. This, to, to counter this idea that superabundant finality is a kind of external 
thing. It, it merely accidentally connects sexuality with children. So I think that's far not only from the mind uh, and intention of Dietrich von Hildebrand, but far from what he actually says. The connection is a much deeper and more fruitful one. Um, all right, that, um, that really is the main, those are the main points I wanted to make, and I'd like to see how, how that sits with you all. I don't know if this is fair, but I guess the question would be what I can see somebody responding to me if I share this way this time that, you know, well, why can't I just grow an apple tree and use it for its wood? What's wrong, like, what's wrong with that? Like, yes, it's an apple tree, but I want to use it for the wood. And yes. Yes, so that's where the analogy limps, uh, clearly because the apple tree is not a person. And therefore, uh, even though I think everything I said is true about the definition of the essence of the apple tree. The fact that we use an apple tree to make a bench, or whatever you want to make of that apple tree, uh, doesn't uh, violate some sort of moral norm. In fact, that's another good probably intended uh, by the creator uh, in connection with trees, that we can cut them down and make houses and, and, and chairs and that sort of thing. So. Even though you destroy the tree in doing that, unlike when you pick its apples, uh, it's entirely legitimate. Whereas in the uh, in sexuality, you, you you would destroy the essence, the nature, the purpose of marriage, the love. Uh, so both the unitive and the procreative meaning would be destroyed, and that is, of course, a a moral matter, a uh, a violation of the person who ought not to be used in this way. So. Does that satisfy? Yeah. Well, like, what about the way to say, you know, if I said, well, you know, like, you know, I'm going to use this for the wood, and So the idea is, what, what if the person's consent and, and freely uh, want to contracept, say, because they want to express their love? I think the, the answer goes back to something we discussed before. That there, you have to draw the distinction between, um, the, uh, or rather you have to realize that the dignity of the person is not just up to them. The dignity of the person is part of what they are by their very nature. And so they, um, they can act against it also freely. Uh, it's not as if everything is okay as long as I agree. And as long as the partner agrees, we can together freely violate each other's uh, personhood. And then marriage becomes, I think, in the, def in the words of Simone de Beauvoir, a... Uh, how does she put it? A mutual masturbation, I think she says. Very strong language. But this kind of mutual use instead of mutual self-giving. Um, and of course, I mean, there are many, many people who, who, who make this mistake who aren't evil people. Uh, I mean, the language is perhaps stronger than you would want to use in, in conversation. But nevertheless, that would be the essence of it, I think. And the task would be to try to show that that's really what's happening. And I think you find very often people who have been using contraception and then um, discover this different means, even if they do it just for health reasons, do find out, hey, this actually is more loving. I mean, this actually improves our relationship, our, our marriage, and so on. So, so I think there's lots of evidence to... Um, to back that up. Yes, John. Yeah, there's one objection often raised to the Brand, namely that this connection between spousal love and offspring is more of an ideal, and that it's better to leave that openness to procreation intact. Uh, but you only depart from an ideal if you contracept for weighty reasons. You don't do anything really wrong. And so some say, uh, 
the analysis doesn't go all the way to provide uh, a real intrinsic wrongness in the contraception. And it's always seemed to me that if we just stopped with the spousal love and, and procreation, we really don't have a really finished argument for the intrinsic wrong. And what I've always found very strong in this text of the is the idea of a profound um, impiety mm -hmm. in contraception, the mm -hmm. whole sense of God mm -hmm. as the author of nature, the author of, of life, the direct creator of each new human mm -hmm. life. That brings in a certain metaphysical impiety yeah. to the rupture of this connection. And that's what I think makes for the, in his mind, uh -huh. the conclusive uh -huh. uh, argument for the intrinsic wrong. He even says in one place, it's just like the platonic argument against suicide, yes. which is based on piety toward the gods. Yeah. Uh, we're not our own, we belong to them, we have no right. To them. Yeah. And so it's a similar kind of having no right with respect to uh, sterilizing yeah. conjugal sexuality. So, I, I wonder if you see it that way, that, that without a certain religious dimension, mm -hmm. you can cast in terms of uh, exactly Christian revelation, but without uh, invoking a certain piety toward the Creator, you, uh, you don't quite have a, a conclusive argument here uh, for, for the intrinsic wrong. Yes, um, that's true, and I didn't focus on the on that aspect of the book, which which he stresses quite a bit. The reverence for you could say what God has put together so mysteriously and so beautifully, um, we have <clears throat> no right. It would be impious for us to separate, in as you say, the same or a similar way as it would be impious to. Um, um, commit suicide. That's what you said, right? Okay. Um, I guess I, for myself, I, well, I agree that, that that sort of gives a kind of force and finality to the argument that uh, it wouldn't have without that. Um, I just don't think it clarifies the connection it, it, to the same degree. There it is, that, that argument is for God has done this mysteriously, and who are we to interfere? Uh, whereas the argument from superabundant finality sheds so much light on the, 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 how beautiful this connection really is, and why it is both um, essentially connected, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but, but without being instrumentally connected. So. That's, uh, well, to that's me, intellectual. Uh, this is not supposed to be a substitute for that, but uh, Right. Yes. So, so I agree um, with that as an, as an amplification, and even as, in some ways, the, the conclusive um, nail in the coffin of the opposite views. Um, I didn't focus it on it because it seems to um, not clarify in the same way. Yes. I think this is where it's useful to look at John Paul II when he in the theology of the body, when he talks about this and takes it a step further. He describes how the procreative and the unit of meaning work in and through each other, or sort of dependent on each other, interwoven. Yeah. And therefore if you separate one from the other, it ceases to be an act of love. Yes. Um, and the, I've got the procreates um man and woman created them one, two, three, six, five, six. Yeah. You'd have to read it loud so people hear it. <laughs> All right, so this is the quote offered from man and woman he created. According to the criterion of this truth, the conjugal act means not only love, but also potential fruitfulness, and thus it cannot be deprived of its full and adequate meaning by means of artificial interventions. In the conjugal act, it is not licit to separate artificially the unitive from the procreative meaning, because the one as well as the other belongs to the innermost truth of the conjugal act. The one is realized together with the other 
and in a certain way the one through the other. Thus, in such a case, when the conjugal act is deprived of its inner truth, because it is deprived artificially of its procreative capacity, it also ceases to be an act of love. So that, that view is also present in Van Hildebrand, in, in, uh, including in the text that we read. Yes, Andrew. Simply, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Crosby was talking about in piety, and John uh, Paul is talking about a lie, okay? Same idea uh, or same circumstances, but irreverence here and, and, and uh, a lie in yeah. terms of the language of the body. Yeah. yeah. Yes, although the, the use of the term lie. I think is is still a bit more clarifying, in that it is you're lying to the spouse, as well as to God, but uh, whereas the irreverence is fundamentally an irreverence of in front of God. I mean, of course, you could also understand that in terms of an irreverence for the spouse and the sexual act. Um, but I think the, the the purpose of that argument is especially to focus on God has done this. We are His creatures. We ought not to separate what God has put together, whereas the argument in um, John Paul II that, it, that uh, the sexual act, that a contraceptive act is in a, in a certain way a lying act, I think there the focus is you're lying to your spouse. What you're doing bodily is saying, I give myself fully and conclusively, um, and yet interiorly you're, you're withdrawing. Uh, beginning with your fruitfulness uh, and therefore also you're withholding from your spouse their fruitfulness uh, that you're, you're denying them motherhood in a certain way, you're denying them fatherhood and so on so, so it's, a, it's a lie in the sense that what I'm doing what, I'm, uh, what, what, what is expressed is uh, belies what's, what's meant and, uh, so I think that's also a very helpful argument that uh, as, as far as I know from Hildebrand doesn't quite make in the same way, but um, it's a very good one. Yeah. And I think uh, the reason why it is a lie is the sort of rejection of the gift implicit in, uh, in that uh, attempting to serve the meanings mm -hmm. of love and openness to the children. And that rejection of the gift, that's where the piety comes in, because the gift isn't out of free, free air, it's not the time Yes, they do come together. But again, I may, I may, I may be wrong here. But my impression of reading John Paul II was always that he's speaking primarily about the the spouses and including the gift. Yes, yes. Right? I'm denying the gift of my wife in a contraceptive act. Yes. So, so th this mutual self-giving is not a self-giving. It's in fact, it includes at least a partial mutual rejection. Exclusion. Or exclusion, yes. Tom. Um, <coughs> I quite like what Bobby Hildebrand has done here in the sense that um, in Veritatis Splendor, uh, John Paul II kind of takes up that that solid definition of the act to include the procreative capacity um, in his defense against a uh, proportionalist or consequentialist uh, response. Um, just, uh, I'm just kind of, I just saw the link and thought I would contribute that to the discussion. Yeah. Um, the, the, the procreative nature being part of the definition of the act, I suppose, um, protects against that. Yes, thank you. Yes? Um, I guess I want to make two related points. One is another problem with the um, knowledge analogy I saw, and I know you've already sort of addressed it, but um, as far as knowledge goes, let's say you want to build a house. You need to have knowledge of house building, some sort of engineering knowledge, right? Um, otherwise, you'd never get the house built. But it seems to me with sexuality, you can get procreation without having the love, which supposedly instrumental. Um, and so this comes to the, my concern throughout. It's been like, say, in an arranged marriage where love develops over time, um, you can still have procreation without there actually being 
um, you know, spousal love in, in the sexual union at first. Um, so I just, I'm trying to figure, you know, the quote from Theology of the Body that, that you read there, um, it's, you know, John Paul II saying you can't separate sex and love, but it seems to me that um, if you have sex within the married union without love, um, it's not, it's intrinsically wrong, it would be, to, to separate out procreation. And I'm, I'm wondering, is it, is, but is it as intrinsically wrong this, to have that sort of relationship without um, spousal love? It, with everything marriage, certainly. I'd have to think through a little bit more at that, this point, but at least initially, I would say that... Um, I'm trying to re remember, <laughs> remind myself of your point. Uh, that initially you do, you, you, you can't really have procreation uh, without... Um, that is to say, all you have then is the birth of a child, but the full sense of procreation isn't really there. I mean, think of the point that I mentioned earlier about the importance of parents to be related to the, their attitude to the child should be that it is a fruit of our love, a gift from God that is entrusted to me, not the product that I have to form and, and you know, I, I don't know, whatever attitude you have towards it. It has to be um, seen in that light. Otherwise, yes, there is a new child, you could call that procreation and that we're still talking about persons, but, and it is successful, I mean, the child has its full value and so on, dignity. But there is something severely lacking, I think, in the, in the act, and so that it's not really fully um, a successful instance of procreation, especially if you include the whole educational aspect in it. And likewise, it is not a successful sexual act either, unless you mean with sex just, you know, Two bodies rubbing together. It, 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 sexual, sexuality has to be a, an expression of love. If it's not, you have destroyed not the biological aspect, but the, but the really the essence of the act. Really, it is not what it ought to be. So, so I would say that initially, that whenever you separate um, procreation, the procreative dimension, you you. Um, you destroy both aspects. And so there I'd go back to the quote that uh, I just read, that the two really stand and fall together. You can't really have one without the other, even though there's an obvious sense in which, in rape, for instance, uh, you, you have the, 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 the fruit, the, the, uh, the person who is fully a person, loved by God, and so on, even though the origin is so despicable. Uh, so, so, hate you see them. So I, there, there's probably more to be said there, and anyone who wants to say something, please, Kevin. Jules, I really liked what you said about different kinds of superabundance, that there could be a kind of superabundance that just happens and we're surprised that it results, but then there's this essential kind of superabundance where the, the thing that results superabundantly is the essence of part of the essence of the action. Uh -huh. Another analogy von Hildebrand gives, I think, in liturgy and personality is uh, worship, that the, the focus should be God's glory, uh, but, and there's the superabundant fruit of growing in humility and piety. We're not at all surprised that we grow in humility and piety, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, in, in some sense, is essential to the action and informs the action, so that if we're seeking to glorify God in ways that are prideful, uh, then we're we're not doing it right, uh, and and similarly, I think with the conjugal act that uh, procreation is uh, informs the act uh, uh, because it is essentially linked, and it and uh, this has to do with the complexity of, of intentionality. That while our the reason why we act is for conjugal love, we also uh, maybe need certain, uh, to use von Hildebrand's language, super actual stances mm -hmm. uh, uh, towards the fact that this action is essentially connected to procreation. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even we should generously uh, will that. Uh, and that impacts the characteristic feature of conjugal love as the mutual uh, self-gift that we want to give our whole being and not withhold our uh, fertility, which I think is something that John Paul II brings up with greater clarity. Yeah, thank you. Um, that is another 
So maybe there ought to be many distinctions made here, something we would be great at. <laughs> with phenomenological clarity dis distinguishing uh, all these various ways in which something can be related as a fruit and, and thereby throwing light on the specific meaning of that in, um, in marriage and in procreation. Yes? Claire, I think, was asking about the uh, allowableness of, uh, of sexual intimacy in the absence of any spousal love, was that? Right. And it, it depends on what one means by the absence of spousal love. If one means some kind of using of the other, then one should recall that, uh, that stern admonition of John Paul where he said, the husband who, though married to a wife and open to offspring, is just gratifying concupiscence and using his wife, commits a sin like that of adultery. And adultery in the heart can get by Christ can be committed. And not because of any, any use of contraception, but because in place of spousal love, the opposite of a kind of using uh, as kind of. I, I don't know if that's relevant to your question. I guess the case I was painting was one where it wasn't a case of using, but it was maybe an arranged marriage where, like, that the full spousal love has not yet developed, you know, but um, it's not going to be using, it's just that sort of union of souls is not. There, um, I think in any, you know, with, with, like you said, that sort of lustful using is going to be wrong, but it's sort of good intentions, but not, but without um, the full development of the love. I'm wondering if that was uh, problematic. What would be the problem with it? I mean, the, the fact that not every sexual act, even between uh, loving, between love and couple, uh, reaches the, you know, is is a full, adequate expression of love. That I think goes without saying, right? Uh, I mean, there's there's a, there's a, there's a whole <laughs> range between uh, a range of of of, of uh, perfections in sexuality being a real embodiment of love, and and, uh, and so there are all sorts of all sorts of imperfect, from that point of view. Um, conjugal acts that uh, are entirely legitimate, um, just not what, what, what they would be like if, yeah, if, if, yeah not yet, not, not, not. Well, it and, and so, and that doesn't need to be using, okay. and of course the, the spouses, I think, are very often aware of the fact that they haven't reached this, this perfection, and yet um, there would be very few children, I think, if parents thought that it would, it was only legitimate if they had achieved this kind of height of genuine, fully conscious self-giving and so on, of one to the other. I don't know how how long you when you want to break, uh, John Henry. So well, let, so let me know. Take as much as another ten minutes, perhaps. Okay. Five to ten minutes. Maybe we break no later than ten after. All right. Before right. So, uh, I would like to try to address Mary Claire's question about that, that the couple comes to uh, sacred matrimony with the full intent in their, in their offering of vows to each other, which creates that foundational reality of love. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's already established going into to this so that love is that foundational love is there so I'm not really sure if, if you meant that the feeling was absent at that time or but I, I just would see it as that through our, through our as the sacrament was wisely set out that we, we speak the vows to each other in love yeah that's thank you that's I think very important that yes. fundamental commitment uh, that has been made this this kind of covenant between is that maybe is that a good word uh, between the spouses in and which involves God uh, you know they, this is all conscious this is super actually present to the spouses uh, that that um, makes up for a lot of imperfections 
in, in their actual life, including in their sexual lives, I think, and, uh, and, and gives it a kind of solid foundation um, in which they can trust one another and, and accept without feeling used in perfections. Yes, right, and uh, that's another aspect I hadn't uh, thought of in preparing the talk, but this, this, the, the importance of accepting ourselves as gift, which I think um, is also a very important one to stress nowadays, because I think people really, they're sort of uh, dissatisfied with what we, what we are, what we have been created to be, and uh, I think this underlies many of the gender controversies nowadays we just we just want to we don't want to accept uh, not just our imperfections or our temper temperament but even uh, our sex as uh, as a, 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 a good god-given reality which we um, you know should be grateful for and use uh, in a way that's appropriate to the gift uh, with gratitude and reverence so so thank you that's another important point to be made. Any other things from the book, specific arguments against uh, contraception? One, one point that I had not realized sufficiently to myself, which came out during last night's discussion, uh, and it was a contribution of Kevin, is that the, the uh, distinction between uh, NFP, natural family planning, and artificial contraception uh, that was still not fully worked out, apparently, in, uh, in Catholic teaching, and von Hildebrand saw it already. So that, in and of itself, was already an original contribution to, um, to modern uh, thought that um, I hadn't realized. It's in here, that distinction, and it's sort of worked out, explained why the one is licit and the other is not. Um, but I didn't uh, go into it at all. Oh, well, so just a point of clarification on that, that... Uh, in reference to so in his 1930 response to the Lambeth Conference, you, you see it details. So certainly, it's already there uh, by the time he's <laughs> writing his his defense of. Uh, Thank you. That was a very silly thing. To say. Yes, but I meant that. I meant that the ideas had already been defended before the encyclical ever came out, def with, you know, given the definitive teaching. So, um, good. I think. Um, I'll just thank you for paying attention, and uh, we'll now have a coffee break. <laughs>